This is an error to Java talk, it's an error to Java introduction, so if you know error to Java, you might get bored. Just warning. Uh, that's me, my name is Laurent Dogan, I'm a French uh, developer advocate, I work for Cashbase. Cashbase is a NoSQL database. Has anyone heard of Cashbase before? Please show your hands. Very few of you, I'm going to talk about Cashbase, that's good. Um, and uh, today I'm here to talk about Ratpack, Eric Java, and Cashbase. Who's heard of Ratpack before? Okay, good, it, it, it seems like you, you're going to want to learn some stuff, which is good. Uh, if you look at Ratpack on Google, this is what you'll find. Um, that's the Ratpack, it was a band of uh, singers and actors uh, in the 60s and 70s in the US. So when you're looking for Ratpack, just write to Google for Ratpack web framework. It's probably better ready, and you will find this, which is a native-based, full-stack, non-blocking web framework. This is actually much more than that. That's like Linux non blocking, Spectrum Java 8, built on top of Netty. Netty is one of the first uh, popular asynchronous non blocking network stack for the JVM. Arrived basically, uh, what was popularized when Java 8 arrived, there's very good reason for that. When you do asynchronous uh, blocking, usually you have uh, anonymous functions, callbacks, lambda, and lambda arrived only in Java 8, in Java 7, you need to write. For one function, and you just need to give one function, you need to write the whole class and then the function. And it's heavy and, and Java is kind of uh, both already, so you don't you know, see it too much. Uh, the asynchronous programming in the Java world got very popular because of that, because it went from uh, the Java 8 with uh, Lambda support, which is pretty nice. Um, and if it's asynchronous, then you need to have the structure. In your to manage this goal, and if you come from the JavaScript world, you might have a lot of promises. A promise is a little query, and then when the result comes in, I'll do something. That's what a pro how a promise work, and that's what Ratback has chosen to do a synchronous query, a synchronous number query. Uh, but the thing is, I'm going to talk about there in Java today, which is fine, because the Ratback people have a very nice smart curve to go from Eric Java to promises. Uh, so yeah, right back if you if you know Node.js already uh, or Vertex, it looks a bit the same. It, it's the same model really. Uh, it's an inner loop. Uh, so I'll talk a little more about this in a second. Um, and this is really what it's all about. Just to try to summarize in one picture because I don't want to talk too much about theory. Uh, the non-blocking versus blocking thing. The first one is the blocking one. You have a web server using Tomcat. Usually you set up. It. Uh, some threads. If you have 200 connections and 200 threads, you have 200 threads ready. And one thread is only taking care of one request. She signed. Uh, if that request requires to do a lot of I.O. work, like writing on disk or doing some network stuff, like asking uh, an answer from a database, well, during that time, somebody does nothing, you know, just, it just waits. Or the answer, which is not very optimized, not very common friendly. So you, you could have them do something else. Because if you use that basic model, I take your request, I wait, remove a bunch of stuff that you requested. Once you have done, the thread can serve the response. And now it's available to answer to someone else. And in the meantime, if you have 200 thread and 400 connections, then you have 200 people that are just eh, waiting something to happen, which is bad. Especially since, at the same time, because you're doing all your work, you say, but you're not doing anything. So you can find a way to make this more automatic and everything. And that's basically what you can do with synchronous blogging. Uh, that's what you said. Uh, which basically is this. There's two or three or four threads. Let's say you have two CPU and they have two both, you can have four threads. Um, and what they do, there's an even group. So every time there's a request that goes in, we analyze the request, analyze what we need to do for the request, put that in the stack somewhere, and then you know, take the next, next one. And once it's in the stack, you pop up the thing, you do your stuff. If it's something very complicated, you can do, do that in the uh, computing thread or uh, dedicated IO thread. So you can put all the workloads 
that are not just answering the request and, and serving the response to something else. And you can keep taking all the requests coming in. And this way, you don't have a CPU that just you know waits and nothing. And then you can serve a lot more requests. So that's basically why you would use in a very small, short, resume, summary kind of thing, why you would use non-working sequence and sequence. Uh, so rat pack, that's, that's the other world example here. And uh, it's very basic. You declare chain of handlers. You can chain all your handlers. And what the handler does is you have uh, a regex from a URL and it associates that regex to <coughs> some code. So here what I'm saying is for every chain, I don't have any regex. Every request that comes in, that's the uh, chain of all. I have a context object. Context object gives me my requests, my response. Uh, give me a lot of other cool stuff that Rust Pack can provide as a framework. And I can just hold the render process and you can just send back hello world. And that's all. That's, that's, you don't have anything else. You don't have to build the world and deploy it to uh, an application server or anything like this. It just, it just, that just starts the server. That's just a simple time process. Uh, test plug, it's not really a plugin model, it's more of a module model, uh, the difference I would do between the two. Uh, when you write a plugin, usually you write a plugin to fit a service that say, hey, I can register a plugin that's written like this, and that allows you to register <coughs> this small thing, and this small thing, that's the plugin architecture. A uh, module can be understood more as a decorator, you don't have to uh, subscribe to something existing, you don't have to write for something that exists, you actually just Write and decorate, so add the behavior to existing interesting code. Uh, it's interesting because it's not a common pattern in Java that much, but it's really common when you do Ruby, and actually, Radback framework has been uh, created by uh, mostly Ruby people, which means that they have an amazing DSL to do Radback in Ruby, and they have great travel integration. But uh, I'm into whatever Java, so I won't talk about Ruby, but it's really nice. And what well, have several modules, several plugins, uh, all very well integrated from my perspective. Basically, I tried to do something with Vertex, and I had to like grasp a lot of modules that were somewhere else. The documentation was, was somewhere else, and it was kind of a, uh, a pain to get everything that I needed. It's right back. Uh, it's so well integrated that it, it's a shame it's recorded because I'm. Uh, and you bet what I'm saying, but Vertex could be like Android and, uh, and uh, Radback could be like iOS. Basically, but Vertex is very open, you can do a lot of stuff, it's really cool. Uh, and then if you want to do web, then Radback is very well integrated, that's a full module. And, uh, and uh, you can shoot, you know, basically it's based on Juice. Juice is the uh, Google uh, Dependency Injection Framework. It's a pretty simple injection framework. You instantiate everything, put everything in some structure, and then when you need it, you just get it. They have a heavy footprint, but usually now people do small applications, so it's fine. And you can switch to another uh, dependency injection framework like uh, Spoonboot or Hotbox Queen or something else. So uh, that's, that's my very quick Radback presentation. I will talk more about Radback, but I'll show you a good example uh, in 20 minutes or so. Uh, Radback is great when your code is spending too much time on I.O., which basically means CPU does nothing because too much stuff are happening on the disk and too much people are waiting for the CPU to do something, which is the first example I showed you. So it's, it's and of course it's great to integrate with uh, a synchronous non-blocking framework code or process that already exists, which is why uh, I'm going to talk about Eric's Java because the Cashmere SDK is based on Eric's Java. So why do you uh, Eric's Java code you thought uh, First of all, who has heard of Eric's Java before? Okay. Uh, when do people go to a reactive, non-synchronous way of coding, when, when you have a traditional way of coding that, is, that actually works right now? Uh, because blocking is bad, well, what, what, I, what I mean by blocking is that talk an example where everybody sends a request and then <coughs> the, the CPU just waits for all the IO stuff to happen. 
much space again, it means it's blocking. It's just you know, waiting for stuff happening while doing nothing. And once it's done, get the answer and, and start talking again to to to, 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 to request. So that's that's that evil, evil, but you know, you can do better to sort of what it is, reactive, simple stuff. Uh, and the, the, the synchronous is hard, uh, no blocking is hard, reactive is better when it's parallelizable, it's better when it's readable, it's better, all these adjectives we'll see in the next uh, slides. But what you're going to tell me is I can already do a synchronous going, if you do JavaScript, when you, usually when you do JavaScript uh, on the browser or in Angular, you have at one point some goal to REST API. This is asynchronous because you have a goal and in your code you give a function to the same method that does the goal. And when the goal is done, then the result is passed to the function and the function is executed, is executed which is asynchronous programming. And this is what you've been doing with JavaScript. <coughs> uh, and you can also do it with uh, Java 7 Future, but it's uh, a little bit full as a, uh, an API to use. So basically, when you have future objects, as soon as you hit uh, get, it just blocks, which is you know, what everybody tends to do when you have an object that only have a method called get. So it's kind of weird to use, and people didn't really get how it worked out. And it's pretty hard to uh, do a composable call because in, every, in, in JavaScript you have your call, your function, that might do another call, and as a function, as a call, as a function. Thing that's quite hard to read, but anyway, you can do it. And with future, then you have the future, and, and, and inside the future, you have to call the future, and so it's then you have to read with everything, so it's pretty hard to do composable code. Uh, and you know, in JavaScript, it looks like this it's called callback L. If you go call, callback L, that's what you'll find. Uh, this is just lots of crappy code. Not really good, but hard to read code. Um, so people came up with their Java. It comes from the Netflix open source guys. Uh, they do lots of amazing uh, framework. Uh, they used to you know, basically send DVDs and VHS uh, the postal way. And now they do streaming, which is amazing how they pivoted from sending DVDs to streaming. And when they went to streaming, they really, really needed, uh, well, first of all, they are probably responsible for 20% of the Maybe more of the web traffic in the US. The 80% is probably more. Uh, and so they had to be very big and distributed, and they went to Amazon. And when you go to a distributed, the more distributed you are, well, the more you have a chance that something bad will happen. Basically, it's just more machine, more chances to have a problem. Basic statistics. Yeah, makes sense. So uh, they went to Eric Java because uh, doing composable code is great to recover from failure. That's also one of the topics we'll talk today. Um, and what it does really, so it comes from the Microsoft world and the guys from Netflix found it really cool. So they implemented Eric in Java and now you have Eric JS, you have Eric PHP, you have Eric Scala, you have Eric Wiley, you have Eric Eric's way of Eric's framework. And it's good because there's Different way of doing synchronous and working code or reactive code, code. And they all have their own operators. If you, if you try the uh, stream API in Java, it's, or if you try the reactive stream, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, there's some operators that you can use to do stuff, uh, which I know is a bit of cryptic right now, which will be clear once we go for the talk. Um, and the great thing about this is that it, since it's so widespread on lots of platforms, then it's kind of having a common API with different languages. It goes from the iterator iterable button to the observable observable button. What that means is an iterable is usually uh, give me my results, you database send your results. Usually you query several stuff, so the database will get everything into a nice light array and just send the whole thing directly through the network. So Big objects from the network, you get the object. Once you have the object, you can start doing things, but you need to have the whole object first. And then you do, you say, give me the next one, and I will do something with the next one. Give me another one, and I will do something with the other one. That's just right. The observable way of doing things is a little different, but it's completely different actually. It's uh, uh, an event based model. You, 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 when you ask something to the database, the database, the database will send you uh, all the results 
as they go. And you come from a, you go from give me the next object, or to hey, there's a new object coming in the stream. What do you want to do with it? Which is great when you want to describe uh, or compose what's going to happen to an object. Much easier than the two four. Um, so yeah, why did they go reactive? I talked a little bit about that, uh, because uh, reacting to failure is important when you are extremely distributed. It's also great to uh, react to uh, changing user load. If you work in a TV company, in a TV show, that let's say is uh, taking votes from everybody that looks at the uh, TV show every Tuesday because it airs on TV every Tuesday, then you know you have to scale up on the Tuesday because everybody will vote at, the, at that time, and then you know scale down because no one's going to do anything on Tuesday. <coughs> or you know if there's a new episode of Game of Thrones, you, you know that everybody's going to connect <coughs> and to see Game of Thrones, and it will be a huge spike. So you need to be elastic. Uh, that's actually there's a video of Sky, the Catholic character, and they explain what their biggest uh, spike is. It used to be uh, football, and now it's Game of Thrones. Everybody logs in at the same time and they need to verify your credential that you, you, you can actually access that TV channel. So, and that has to be like every time. You don't want to wait, you, know, you just you put the channel on and you wait until you know, all the other, that if you have 200 friends, you wait that the 200 people have their answer and then we can put the 200. So, so there you can get that. And it's pretty nice and they can sustain the game of Rome kind of. Uh, no, which is good. Uh, so you need to be able to do that, based on that, and that's what uh, using a Java or programming the reactive way will allow you to do. And you, it can all be summarized by this. Uh, latency is basically, I'm the user, I did my query, and I now I'm waiting for something to happen. Because there's not enough thread that's going to be actually. And that sucks. And so I'm going to go somewhere else or do something else. Etc. Et um, so that's the, the, the very short why you could do why you, you would want to do average Java, and now we can talk about average Java practice. Um, <coughs> if you want to get one object the synchronous way, give me t, give me an object. Okay. If you want to have multiple objects, you have an iterative object. You next, 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 etc. When you go asynchronous. If you want to get an asynchronous object, just one for the future. And if you want multiple objects, you can use observable, which is what Eric Java uses, and, and it just really moves you from this uh, uh, tool model to push model, which is putting this, give me the next interval, and you have to do that all the time, was for a while, etc. Uh, when something's happened, when an error happened, just deal with it, and when it's completed, just return the result. If you go the push way, every method starts with on for a very good reason, is that because it's completely based on events. You iterate your object, you, you get everything at the same time, and then you can do something with it. An observable, you open a stream, and then some objects are pushed through the stream. And once there's a new object, you can do something. Once there's an error, you describe what you want to do, and once it's completed, you describe what you want to do. And that's a, a, a shift of thinking that's a little bit of a it's really good to do uh, data intensive application or even web, web application. Uh, the, the Spring people, Spring 5, is going to be fully based on Reactor, which is the, the new generation of Reactor framework. We're taking the good bits of uh, Java and the Reactor stream. And they're going to take the whole web stack, the whole Spring 5 is going to be based on Reactor programming, which is good. Our QCO, I hope it's enough. <coughs> That's a basic example of how you want to get doc how you get a document from Catchbase. Catchbase is a simple database. Uh, it's a key value to store as well. So when you store a document, you have an ID and then get doc. It's basically saying give me the document without the ID. Doc. Uh, so bucket the async, you have to call the async method to get the asynchronous API because we understand that it's not really the easiest way to start. So we made that choice that by default the bucket will be synchronous. So get will just return to you an object. And if you asynchronous, get will return to you an observable of objects. Which is what I'm doing here. And 
Actually, if you stop here, nothing happens. You just describe something, you just describe an observable of get. So, an observable something. An observable that will get you something when, once you subscribe to it. And you could add more and more operators. You could do get. If there's no answer, you could do get somewhere else. You, you could do a lot of things. And until you call subscribe, nothing happens. And that's good because it allows you to describe everything you want to do before it happens. And it's much more easy to read than doing several form or filtering or putting some work in the and doing some stuff and then going back to the stream. It's, uh, it's, it's really nice. And once you subscribe to something, then you can decide what you want to do when there's a new object that's been an error or when there's no more objects on the theme. Um, so if you look at the documentation of Eric Chai, you will see a lot of schemas like this, Marvel diagram. Uh, and they use Marvel to explain all the types of operators in Eric Chai. So the just operator is taking an array of stuff and transforming it into an observer. So it's kind of like taking an iterable, you know, it's a collection, it's a Java collection, and wrapping it into an observable semantic. So it might not seem useful right now. Because you know you're not doing any AI or work or anything, you're just saying, okay, this big array that I already had, I'm going to move it to a more reactive uh, fashion. And that's interesting because in Java 8, when you have a collection, you actually have a stream API from Java 8 that's much uh, much smaller in scope than whatever Java does, but kind of below the, the same sort of thing. And it looks like this in code. So I will just push elements. I haven't called subscribe yet, so nothing happened. Once you call subscribe, all the elements will come uh, into the uh, call method. Uh, and the interesting thing is, it's completely asynchronous. So you might actually have something like ACB instead of ABC. Because it's completely asynchronous. You, can, you have some function to specify that you want the, the string to be ordered, but you know. Uh, there's a bunch of other uh, operators. Once is interval, every second write something. This thing is basically going to add 0, 1, 2 every two seconds. You can also create your own observable by hand. This is mostly used by people that write uh, other operators. And what that requires is uh, implement the call method. And uh, do the call yourself on the on next method. On the on error, if there's an error during the call, this thing. And on complete, if you want to complete the observable. Something on the side. The most important one is probably this one and the next one. It's called map. If you've done some programming before, you probably know what it is. And what it does is I'm taking an object and I'm returning another object, which might seem like it's nothing, but it's actually a bit cool. Uh, so right now I'm taking a, a circle and giving back something else. Which uh, in traditional code like this, I'm taking my document, and in docu the document in cache is uh, a key value pair and some metadata. So when I do get doc, I don't have my JSON string yet. I need to do doc the content to get the value part, to get my JSON part. So that's why I'm using the map of operators. And I'm moving from an observable of JSON documents, which was what I had done there, to an observable of, uh, to, yes, to an observable of JSON string or doc the content that already is the actual one of my document. And then there's another thing called flat map. It's a little different if you look at the signature. Actually, it's not that much. Here it returns an object. Here it returns, there's another error with objects. It returns an observable object. And it actually merged every observable here. So you have some object coming in. And there's a function that transforms each object into another observable of something else. And all those observables of something else will be merged into one single observable. So I have the circle, which is something to do other objects. Nothing happens. I have two circles very close, again, it's synchronous, so they probably won't be, well, maybe, you don't know, it's a synchronous. You won't get the two green first and the two blue first. It's a synchronous, so you get the green blue. Yeah. <coughs> and it looks like this. Uh, Previously, I was using get to get some sort of cash, but I'm using a query. You can do query, it's a database. The, the moment you go from a key value store to a database is where you can do a query 
based on the value of the key value pair. So Redis has been a key value store for a while, now you can do query Redis, uh, and I think you can. Uh, Mongo was a document store because you could do a query based on the value. And Cashbase is a document store because you can do a query based on the value part. That's what I'm doing here. I'm doing a query. Uh, I'm doing a view query. Uh, I'll explain the difference. I'll explain what is a view query later. Uh, it returns me a bunch of documents. Well, it returns first, it returns an object that contains the answer, contains the metadata of the query, and contains if there's, there's been an error or something. So I'm uh, moving this to, I'm just taking the rows. It's a list of objects, so I'm mapping that list of objects to an observable of rows, which is what we have on the, the, the first flat map. So this, the, the second flat map gets an observable of rows, and a row is an ID again and value, so I'm having these two uh, documents, so row the document basically, so I get my actual contents. And I can do uh, another operator called filter, which is basically, uh, would be in a synchronous way, you have all your documents in the list and you do a loop, and when the document maps the uh, if section uh, 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 that you put in the loop, then you can add that document to another list that you've created before, and once it's done, then you can serve the list to the next step. You don't have to do it, you just do a filter, and it will let only the document that is filtered go through. And again, since you didn't, the moment you don't do a subscribe, then nothing happens. Okay, you're just describing lots of things happening, all of the cameras, which is, again, very nice. And then you can call account and basically give you the number of be uh, that the uh, uh, alcohol by volume is superior to five. That's what it does. And when, once you call subscribe, it does the call to the database, get everything in. And uh, as soon as they go, because it's in the base, it process them. And no way to get all the data back. Um, that's another one called group by, where basically you say it's probably easier to look at the code than the actual uh, diagram. Uh, I have a document, they have a field called type. The value of type could be different. I'm using the beer sample, and the beer sample has a document uh, of type of beer and type of brewery. So after the group by, I would have a structure of objects like a map that allow me to uh, get beer, get all the beer document, or get brewery, get all the brewery documents. So you can do interesting things. If you do, well, it's a challenge in France, but if you have done .NET before, uh, there's a very cool framework called EQ that has some of the same semantic and it's really, really nice. Uh, you can do buffer as well. I mean, there's a bunch of interesting uh, operators. You don't have to go through everything in there. There's much more than what I'm showing you today. Uh, and a buffer will allow you to you know, buffer every uh, call, every new object for some second, which is exactly what you see here. That's a spike of operation per second going to catch base. And you can see that they've been bufferized. Uh, you know, here's a spike, nothing happens, it's a buffer. Once we have everything, it's not a spike. It's a transit. That's basically that's, that's controlling uh, your flow of execution just by saying it's a buffer of stuff. Now, try to think how you would implement that with a uh, thread and, and stop thinking about it because it's still only the one wants to do that. Uh, that's the, the, the filter that I showed before, it's pretty basic, there's a lot of things coming in, I only want something else. And that's the first and only time I think I will show you the Java second way of doing things. I talked about Lambda before, and all the attempts for using Lambdas. Uh, actually, when you use Lambda, you have to use a whole anonymous class in Java. What, what, what using Lambda does is exactly the same thing as you know, by the JDF done by you. Nicer. And so if you look at the flat map function, uh, it's a method that takes a string and it returns an observable or something. And by doing so, it uh, goes to batch base to get a document based on the string ID. So you would have an observable of this document, which is exactly what uh, this method is giving. So, Bucket async that yet gives you an observable or something. So in the end, you might be thinking, okay, I have an observable of this document. But actually, you have lots of string coming up. So you have lots of observable coming up. 
So if you were trying to think in a traditional way, you would have at the end a list of observable coming up. But since you're doing a flat map, instead of, instead of having a list of observable, you have an observable. So they basically emerge everything into a single stream of object, which is why flat map is so nice. I have 15 minutes left and I'm late. But that's fine. Uh, there's another uh, object called first. Um, the first practical use case for that in cache base would be cache base is a distributed database. You have some replicas of your data, which is fine because again, the distributed stuff, bad things could happen. The more you distributed, the more you have chances to have issues, but that's fine. Basically, the best distributed system is not the one that's going to tell you nothing's going to happen, it's going to be, it's going to be fine. It's the one that's going to tell you something bad is going to happen. And it's fine, we will we'll go through it and we'll get with it and it's going to be fine. And that's why cache base is pretty cool. Uh, if you lose the active data node, uh, you can get your document from all the replicas. You can have several replicas. And when I build that query, I don't want to wait to get all the replica in my observables. As soon as they have one, which is why I'm in the first uh, operators, I could use a single if I was expecting only one document, uh, there's lots of other uh, observable. Uh, now there's something you might have noticed with observable is that uh, semantically, you, you cannot know if you're gonna get one object or several objects. It's just a stream. When I do a get, I intend to get just one object because there's only one active version of my document in my database. Um, but actually, and I, and I receive an observable, but an observable could be more than one object, and you have no way of knowing that. Which is sad, but they're fixing it. In Reactor, you will have something like a single observable. <coughs> when you create the observable, you actually define it's going to be just one object. A bit like a future, but with all the cool Rx Java, <coughs> which is nice. So at that time, and I know it's soon in the morning, <coughs> and just, uh, <laughs> I hope it wasn't too much. It's a very gentle introduction to Rx Java, usually. Most of the reaction is java.com and harder to go through. Um, do you have any questions so far? I'm curious who did the workshop yet, uh, last year. Oh, yeah. The, uh, yeah, I did the Narrow Java workshop last year with a colleague of mine. I did it in the description. Cool. Well, did anyone of you attend it? Because I know I've seen some of you before, but maybe I don't know. Uh, I was supposed to show you an example, uh, but I have uh, 20 minutes left. No, 13. 13 minutes left. I'm going to play with cache base. Cache base is a MySQL database, it's distributed. There's three kinds of services data, index, and query that you see as a dashboard. And then there's a whole bunch of services that we don't see that cache base knows about and we end up having uh, Data service is the one that takes the key value uh, uh, operation and just write stuff. Everything that has anything that happens in RAM, so when you read or write something, it's in RAM. And your version is considered done. And once, once it goes in RAM, it goes into several queues. There's one queue that will eventually persist into disk, one queue that will maybe replicate it to another node or to even another cluster, and there's one queue that's going to send it to the index service. The index service is going to index all the documents, and then with the query service, you can run a query that uses uh, so, you know, pretty uh, basic stuff. It is a masterless, masterless uh, architecture. Uh, in uh, Mongo or other uh, traditional SQL database, you have a master that takes all the writes operation and that replicates all the new stuff to the slave, and the slave takes all the writes. In cache base, every node can take the writes, and they all replicate to every other node. No single code failure. And the sharding is done automatically. I don't know if you guys did some Mongo before. I tried to shard Mongo manually. It's kind of a thing. Here we distribute data automatically based on the key of the documents. When you do, when you do a key value set, we hash the key. We have an internal ID. We know that this internal ID will go into this particular part of the cluster. And it's, it's absolutely consistent. So each time you write and you read you ne next to write, you know that you're going to go to the exact same place. You're going to go in RAM again, and it's going to be fine. Now, you might, what, what happens if someone unplugs your computer while the thing is still in RAM and has a bit persistent? When you've lost your data, it's a trade-off. You, know, you want to be, you want it to be fast, so you consider that it's written as soon as it's in RAM. But if there's something you really want to be written, then on a per-call basis, you can say, 
wait until this has been persisted to disk or wait until this has been replicated to one, two, three or four or whatever. So you can, uh, you can move the, the cursor up there uh, very well. Um, here's an example of uh, elasticity with cache rate. It's uh, Tuesday, there's going to be the voice on the TV. And they know that everybody's going to vote, so they know that to have a big cluster. So they do that on note and, the and then the trigger an operation called the rebalance, which basically redistributes everything uh, evenly on all the nodes to spread the load evenly on all the nodes to make sure that you won't crash when everybody starts voting. And what happens when you lose a node? Let's say you lose the node in the middle, then the documents that were on the active pass are not available anymore. Which is when you can use the operation called get from replica that will allow you to maybe get it from all the other stuff. And this is also what you want to do what we call a failover. And a failover is uh, basically detecting that you're missing part of your cluster. But it's fine, it's been replicated. It's been replicated here and here and here. So what it does is, in a, an instance, because just, uh, it's even not an atomic operation that goes to, uh, you just move a flag from replicate to atomic. So the data is available all over again. You just need to detect that you have uh, a failure. This can be done automatically because each node are being themselves. itself. Uh, you probably want to do it manually because Three ways of getting document out of cache base key value. View, a view is like a materialized view in SQL. Uh, you create an index and then you an index. And then there's a very cool thing called Nicole, which is basically uh, a SQL for JSON. You just write select, blah, 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 from a bucket with a document where then you can use all your JSON fields. And you don't have to have a schema or anything, you just throw a bunch of JSON in there and it's fine. Um, Juice, juice 
it's that thing where you need to instantiate everything at the beginning and then everything's going to be available in the context. So what I'm saying is, I'm connecting to a cashless cluster. If I don't put any parameters here, it's going to assume it's on the local host. I'm opening a bucket. If I don't put any parameters, it's going to assume it's a different bucket. Then I punch this instance to a class because everything you inject in Ratback, you can get based on the <coughs> Usually, most injection frameworks based on the name. Here, it's based on the class. So you can have, you cannot have two uh, instances of the same class in your registry. I don't know why they did that, uh, but mostly fine. I never had an issue with it, so it's fine. Um, so I've declared my configuration. I know I'm going to be able to connect to to get an instance of buckets to do my stuff. And then my handlers, uh, I declare a new uh, prefix. Every query that starts with a uh, user that arrives at that server will be uh, forwarded to a handler called user handler. And what the user handler does is first, users, is there another part of the URL? If so, it's probably a user ID, which is the regex you see here. And if it's a user ID, then I'm going to be able to do some stuff based on the HTTP bug of the query, of the request. I need to stop saying query, it's a request, an HTTP request. Uh, so I'm taking my repository, it's a lightweight object document mapping uh, layer uh, that allows allow me to store uh, user objects. I haven't shown you the user object. User object is very simple. It's just a username, which is going to be the key of my document, which is why it's an entity with ID, a first name, a last name, and a type that never changed, which is a string called user. And uh, using a repository allows you to Store that as JSON directly into Catrace without having to do anything with JSON. So I took my repository and then I use something called by method. By method allows me to declare uh, the, on, the ongoing stuff of the chain of events based on the HTTP verb. So if there's a query a request to user slash the name, and if it's a get, then I go to this code. If it's put, I go to this code, if it's delete, I go to this code. Um, if it's a get, I do repository that get user, it returns to me an observable. Nothing has happened. Okay, here, nothing. It's just an observable user. No one has subscribed to that thing. And I told you before, wrap back this promises. So what it does is wrap that observable into a promise. Once it does that, subscribe to the observable. And once the, and it's, it's interesting because here it's a promise symbol, so in that fact they actually uh, give you uh, the ability to say, I have an observable and I'm expecting only one object. Um, and then as soon as there's an object coming in, you go into the next part. The next part is just taking the context object of the request and putting render, which is basically when your uh, request stops and where you start writing the response and sending an answer to the user. And what it's doing is rendering uh, a user, and I can render that user based on uh, the content type of the request because I created something called a user renderer, which renders object of the user. And so I have my full URL. I could decide what to do based on HTTP verb. And once I render something, I can decide how to render it based on the header uh, content type which is what you have here. If the content type is uh, JSON, which is one of the built-in content type they have, if it's JSON slash uh, application slash JSON, then it works, just render uh, a JSON string. If it's plain text, then just pure, pure base to string, and it works. And one of the questions I had in my talk yesterday was how do you um, use traditional blocking code? Because here, all my code returns either observable or promises. All the services you have, that we can call them legacy services, they don't return uh, an observable and they might do blocking code. How do you integrate <coughs> blocking code with the Ratback way of doing stuff, which is basically doing stuff in the promise and then once the result is here, doing something else like sending an answer to, uh, sending the response back to the client. Uh, I have something very basic called data extraction service in my other application. And what it does is just uh, launch something to uh, command line on the machine, on the server, so it's just born as a process. Uh, and everything here is, is blocking, right? It's not, 
it's a uh, it's not, not nothing is happening on JVM. It's happening on the OS under the JVM. So all that thing I can use uh, something called blocking. It's a wrapback uh, <coughs> class that allows me to wrap some blocking code <coughs> into a promise. What get send me is a promise. So it doesn't do anything until you call you know, until you you actually call the promise and, and get the result. So it's it's a bit like a future if you will, uh, but with the promise semantic of what that is. So it's great because it allows you to uh, migrate existing application fairly easily uh, into Webpack. Uh, let me find another more interesting example. Maybe. Thank you. 